if I meet an architect who was active in the 60s, I, I, I always ask him or her, what were you doing in the 60s? It's a bit like if you meet, um, uh, you used to meet a German who had fought in the war. You want to know what they did. I mean, maybe they were honorable people fighting for their country, but it may be that they were doing something terrible. And the same applies to an architect in the 60s. Do, were you knocking down town centers for us? Thanks very much. Were you building the, were you knocking down the center of Birmingham for us and putting in the bull ring? Were you knocking down the center of Cambridge for us and putting in Petit Curie? Were you taking apart 18th century town centers and putting in concrete monstrosities? These people did evil things. It was not only the commentators who loathed the new architecture. Those earmarked to live in the new high-rise developments were keen to have their voices heard too. And I don't like that the, the proposed plan, the metropolis come true that they propose for us. Well, I mean, who wants to live in that? Who wants to live in a, in a tower flat or even a, a few stories above? I have to ask a caretaker or a please may I hang a picture on these composition walls? Please may I keep a cat? In fact, some of these places it would be cruel to keep an animal in. Conceding that a great many of these modern places you could not do those things. Well, I say that the places that are built where you can't do homely things, the things that make home, the things that spell home, those places are not home. The need to build more and more houses led to the pioneering of quicker and cheaper construction methods, system build and prefabrication. I think that industrialized production will bring quicker housing. We shall see in the future houses coming off the conveyor belt like motor cars. It's already started, in fact. Big concrete panels are coming off the uh, casting beds into the curing yards and sent off by lorry to the sites and the amount of building labor on the site is quickly being reduced. New methods, new materials, untested methods, untried materials. These system-built dreams were often soon racked with condensation, rot and mold. I mean, is that it now? You know when it's crawling? You just can't put him down. Every time it rains, it comes down walls in the living room. It's no good. I mean, in winter, even as, as quilt on his bed, it's wet through. The government subsidised high-rise building, so hiding the real cost. What's more, it turned out that the promise of increased density was also myth. I think the strange thing about this is that the whole selling point of all of these tower blocks is that you can get more people on less land. But actually, that's the reverse of the truth. Actually, if you'd built terraced housing, you'd have got more people on that land than the tower blocks do. Because in order to meet planning regulations, to let light into the bottom of the tower, the towers have to stand so far apart in often underused parkland that you can't get very many people on these plots. In 1968, the House of Cards came tumbling down. In the early morning of the 17th of May, something happened in a system-built tower block in East London that marked the turning point in the decade of destruction. With the explosion at Ronan Point in, in Newham in East London in 1968, Ministry officials started to actually look at some of the material they had and journalists started to dig into it and expert academics started to look into it and architects. And actually what they found to their horror was that the analytical basis of a lot of this just wasn't true. It wasn't going to be cheaper, it wasn't going to be faster and it was going to actually cost more to maintain. It only took this one collapse to reverse government policy. The 60s had been a massive totalitarian vision Experts planning a perfect future for the benefit of, well, who? Property developers, yes, did well out of the 60s. Uh, people who invested in property in various ways did well. Um, nobody else that was involved in that area did very well, no. Those town planning bullies of the 60s gave us another legacy, mile upon mile of concrete roads. Towns and cities became more friendly to the car and totally hostile to the pedestrian. The mindless destruction of all things Victorian also swept away thousands of miles of rail track and countless stations. More than 2,000 stations will be closed. The most dramatic effects are in Scotland. 
Remote areas of the Highlands will lose their services. North of Aberdeen, very few will be left. Wales takes a body blow as well. Holiday resorts in the West Country share the fate of many market towns. No station, no passenger trains. In the North East, little more than the main North-South links will remain. It is quite extraordinary looking back at Beeching. If anyone had proposed shutting down thousands of miles of, of country lanes and suburban roads because they didn't pay, everyone would have thought they were barking mad. But again, the, the, the modernizers saw the railways as old-fashioned, Victorian, and in some way part of a, of a British past they wanted to get rid of. Britain, the home of railway travel, lost two-thirds of its rail network in this one measly decade. Instead, the 60s fell in love with the car. So jam today and jam tomorrow. The one system that could have helped ease our transportation problems today was butchered, ripped limb from limb. The bell also tolled the death knell for hundreds of the country's finest schools. Having decided how and where we would live, political dogma now decreed how and where we would be educated. The reformers of the 1960s claimed that they were going to make the education system fairer and more equal. Unfortunately, the result was that it became more unfair and more unequal. In imposing an untried, universal, comprehensive system, the government promised to end the tyranny of selection by ability. It was very arrogant. It was enforced by one of the cleverest British politicians of the 20th century, Anthony Crosland, educated at Highgate uh, Private School, who said he wanted to destroy every fucking grammar school in England. And what a disgraceful thing to say, because what he achieved, Anthony Crosland, was that he took away the ladder of opportunity from literally millions of working class children, young women and young men. The comprehensive system promised a fair chance to all children, especially working class children. But the 60s were the years of broken promises and lost opportunities. If you look at the British education system before the change, there was one part that worked, which was the ground schools. There was one part which was supposed to exist and didn't, the technical schools, and there was one part that was working quite badly, which was the secondary modern. What the, the, the rational response to this would have been to strengthen the grammar schools and perhaps open more of them, and to make substantial reforms in the secondary moderns and to build the technical schools. But rather than do this, which would have been the educational response, what we did was destroy the only good part, and the result has been that for an awful lot of people, the only schooling available is actually worse than the secondary moderns, which the project was supposed to be getting rid of. The answer to the idea that those who didn't get into grammar schools had failed and were going to sink, the answer is to make the other schools better, not to abolish the ones that are good, for goodness sake, but to look at the secondary moderns and say, here is a terrific opportunity that we're not meeting. How are we going to make these into fantastically good schools? Faith can be blind. In the 60s, it was also deaf. Deaf to those who urged caution. For selection is bound to persist, no matter with what goodwill any local authority attacks the problem. There will be a pecking order among schools. There are good comprehensive schools and bad ones, some very good ones, some thundering bad ones. And a parent who happens to know anything at all about the schools will prefer to send his child to the one rather than to the other. The ideal behind comprehensivization was a perfectly laudable ideal because of the imperfections of simply tossing people on the scrap heap. However, what replaced it was also imperfect, but was imperfect in a different series of ways. And what happened was, as a consequence, uh, large sections of the middle class who could began to tinker with the new system and use it so that they could gain an advantage which quite often more working class families couldn't utilise. It's impossible after the late 60s for any government of any political stamp to turn back this tide because the buildings have been built. The infrastructure has been put in place that will carry through the comprehensive revolution. You cannot any longer have three different types of school in each area because you spent hundreds of millions of pounds on building one type of school for one area. It's impossible thereafter to turn back the clock. <laughs>